So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, uh, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to this session on issues concerning desistance uh, within um, CrimCon Day 3 Stream 1. Um, uh, I'm uh, chairing this session and then we have uh, speakers on four different papers. Uh, we will take it within the with the order that it is in the program. Um, if you have any questions, then I know the, the speakers are very um, keen to, to answer them. If you just click the Q&A button at the bottom of the um, at the bottom of the, the, the screen, uh, a Q&A box should pop up and you should be able to answer a question. And then we'll go through those questions at the end. We will be holding all questions until after the um, all the speakers have finished. And if you could please put your um, questions in the Q&A box rather than the, the meeting chat uh, box, then that would be much appreciated. Uh, so first of all, we have um, Michael Cordy and James Ray from University of Central Florida. So if Michael, you want to start, uh, take it away whenever you wish. All right, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. Today I will present on some research that my colleague James Ray and I have been working on that examines the role of positive aspirations and deviant peer associations in the desistance process. Specifically, we are interested in the role that disassociation from deviant peers may play as a mechanism through which positive aspirations affect desistance. Um, so while there's still plenty of debate about the most appropriate conceptual uh, and operational definitions of the concept, most scholars have accepted that desistance from offending is a process that unfolds over time. Uh, and consistent with this way of thinking, um, consistent with this way of thinking, desistance does not require cessation of offending. It also includes de-escalation and deceleration over time. Um, the emergence of a substantial body of empirical research on desistance has led to the development of several promising theories of desistance. And these theories can sometimes be classified based on the relative weight they give to structural factors such as changes in such as marriage or employment status or subjective such as within, within individual changes in identity or cognitive transformations. So the relative weight they give to structural versus subjective factors. And given the goal of better understanding desistance as a process, a lot of contemporary scholarship has prioritized identifying the mechanisms through which desistance occurs. And so this involves, involves both quantitative and qualitative work aimed at distinguishing between causes and correlates of desistance and identifying specific pathways of desistance. The current study is well situated in the context of Paternoster and uh, Excuse me, sorry, I did uh, need to share that screen. Huh? And my apologies for that. So um, the current study is well situated in the context. Are we good now? Yep, that's fine. Okay, thank you. So the current study is well situated in the context of Paternoster and Bushway's identity theory of desistance. So Paternoster and Bushway emphasize the importance of intentional self change. So they give primacy to uh, subjective individual level changes at the, at the start of the desistance process. Specifically, ITD argues that identity change is at the uh, core of desistance. Uh, initial motivation to desist comes from a linking of past failures together uh, and an association of these failures with one's status as an offender. So this idea of the working self. Once this crystallization of discontent occurs, individuals work to realign their preferences away from the feared self, so who they don't want to be, who they, they the identity that they don't want, towards uh, their possible self, who they hope or who they aspire to be. Uh, Identity change then in the, in, under ITD logically must come before structural change. And the model tested in the current study provides a partial test of some elements of ITD. Specifically, we consider 
positive aspirations as a component of the possible self. And we consider disassociation from deviant peers as an indicator of changing preferences that move away from the feared self and towards the possible self. Uh, here's a look at the conceptual model for the current study. All three of these concepts uh, presented here are measured developmentally. So that is we assess change over time in each using latent growth curve modeling. Um, and the model presented here is justified by both uh, ITD and extent, uh, extent empirical research on desistance. Um, so as indicated by the quotation on the slide, uh, Paternoster and Bushway uh, highlight network realignment as a key component of the desistance process. And this is also supported by prior research by War, um, Giordano and colleagues, and Shaplin and Bottoms have also identified uh, network or peer network alignment and social network realignment as a key mechanism of the systems. Uh, to answer our research questions, we utilize the Pathways of Desistance study. Uh, this is a longitudinal panel study of over 1,300 uh, adjudicated juvenile offenders from two jurisdictions. And the youth in the sample were about were aged between age 14 and age 18 at the start of the study, and they were followed uh, for seven years after the initial enrollment in the study. And there's a total of uh, 11 waves of data uh, in the pathway. So there's a baseline interview and 10 follow-up interviews. Um, so each uh, participant completed um, those 11 interviews. And so that's, that's a, a good idea of the sample. So this is a sample of adjudicated youth about 1300 um, and you can see some of the demographic breakdowns there. They're tracked over seven years. So uh, again, 14 to 18 at the start of the study and they're about age 21 to 25 at the end of the study. So again, it gives us that uh, important developmental period at sort of the beginning or the transition to adulthood. So um, to answer our research questions, we relied on three primary measures collected throughout the pathway study. Our outcome, our measure of desistance was self-reported offending. Uh, and we relied on a, uh, this relied on a, a 22 uh, offenses, a variety score calculated from based on 22 offenses that individuals self-reported their engagement in since their last interview. So this would measure their behavior since the last interview. And this was coded essentially as a proportion of the 22 behaviors that they engaged in. Um, and so this ranges from zero to one with higher scores indicating a greater variety or higher level of involvement in uh, a more diverse involvement in delinquency. Our primary uh, independent variable, uh, primary predictor here is aspirations, which were measured using the aspirations for work, family and law scale from the perceptions of chances for success measure. And this is a seven item measure uh, measured on a Likert type scale that asks the respondents uh, about their attitudes, about their aspirations for what they hope to achieve. Uh, how important is it for you to have a good job or career? How important is it for you to graduate from college? These were a couple example items. And the responses range from not at all important to very important with higher scores indicating higher aspirations. Finally, the, our mediator variable that we have identified, uh, peer delinquency, was a 12 items asking about how many of their friends engaged in uh, different forms of delinquency. Again, a five point Likert type scale uh, where they responded on one for none, five for all. So higher scores equal more peer delinquency. Our analytic strategy involved multiple steps. So first we estimated latent growth curves of aspirations, uh, delinquent peer associations and self-reported offending. Next, uh, a series of parallel process models were conducted in order to examine if changes in dependent variable, changes in the dependent variable, self-reported offending, the mediator and the independent variable aspirations were associated. So we're looking at the association between change over time in these three key, uh, key variables. Last, we uh, estimated a parallel process model of mediation uh, in order to test the mediation of the slope of delinquent peers on the relationship between the slope of aspirations and self-reported offending. For more information on this uh, approach, Seelig and Preacher 2009 is a good resource on sort of longitudinal media mediation analyses. So what did we find? So the first step of our analyses looked at latent growth curves. And for all three variables, a uh, quadratic growth curve was found to be the best fitting model. Generally, we found that aspirations gradually increased over time within the path st pathway study. So uh, on average, there was a general increase in aspirations over this key period of development for the pathway sample. Uh, subsequently, we also found that 
uh, peer association, deviant peer associations and self-reported offending declined gradually across the waves. The central focus or more of the focus of our uh, analyses was on the parallel process models, um, using change over time essentially in one variable to predict change over time in another. And in terms of the relationship between aspirations and peers, so we established the relationship between the predictor and the mediator here. We found that as aspirations increased over time, the slope of delinquent peer association decreased. So there was a significant negative relationship between the slopes. Um, as uh, in terms of the relationship between aspirations and self-reported offending, as aspirations uh, increase over time, we found that offending decreases over time. So we found a significant negative relationship between the slopes. And for the relationship between the mediator, peers, and self-reported offending, we found that as uh, delinquent peer associations increase, um, self-reported offending also increases. So we found a significant positive relationship there. Finally, turning towards our longitudinal mediation analysis, uh, we found the test of the indirect effect was negative and significant. So as aspirations increase, delinquent peer association decreases, which is associated with a decrease in self-reported offending. So our outcome of desistance. Um, and the association between the slope of aspirations and the slope of self-reported offending was no longer significant once the association between uh, the slope of delinquent peers and the slope of self-reported offending was included. So that suggests uh, essentially that uh, changes in deviant peer associations over time fully mediated the relationship between um, aspirations, changes in aspirations and changes in self-reported offending over time. Importantly, these uh, results held after we controlled for a number of factors mentioned earlier. So what does this mean or how are we interpreting these findings? Um, overall, we, we interpret our findings as largely consistent with uh, Pattern, Oster and Bushway's uh, identity theory of desistance. So increases in aspirations over time are associated with desistance. So again, our measure of increases in uh, aspirations, we're looking at as kind of a partial indicator of the possible self. So that was associated with change in self-reported offending over time or our measure of desistance. Uh, perhaps more importantly, in terms of identifying the mechanisms or the process of change, we found that disassociation from deviant peers is a significant mediator of the relationship between aspirations and desistance. So that possible self, who do we hope to become uh, in the desistance process, um, disassociating or moving away, realigning our social network appears to be a, a, a important mediator in that process or important part of that process. Um, and this is consistent with a, some prior uh, qualitative and quantitative work. Uh, how we're interpreting that, a few different interpretations. So again, the network realignment may be part of sort of testing the new identity. So this is a fledgling identity for the sisters. They're thinking about or considering making changes, uh, moving away from deviant peers or testing out uh, relationships with uh, pro-social peers is a, a beginning step in the process. I'm gonna um, have to, to stop you there because uh, we, um... We otherwise we'll run out of time yep. for questions so at the end. But... Signal and diachronic self-control. So again, thank you, uh, and we'll have questions at the end. Thank, thanks very much, uh, Michael. Uh, uh, and now we'll move on to Haley uh, Boxall from Australian uh, National University. Um, Haley, whenever you're ready. Okay. Oh, might actually need to share my screen. That would be helpful, yes. <laughs> yep. Uh, yep, that's working now. Cool. All right. Um, good morning. I, I don't know what times and everyone's in. I'm just going to say good morning because it's good morning here. Uh, good morning from Australia. Uh, my name is Hayley Boxall. I am a PhD student from the Australian National University, um, but I'm also a research manager at the Australian Institute of Criminology. But this morning I've got my PhD student hat on. So today what I wanted to do is describe some of the preliminary findings from my PhD thesis, which is looking at the role of female victim survivors in supporting the desistance of violence and abuse as perpetrated by male partners. So it's a ginormous project and I'm gonna focus in on a couple of findings, particularly as they relate to definitions of desistance. So intimate partner violence is one of the most costly, harmful and common forms of violence against women um, in Australia and internationally. And so 
there has been obviously a huge amount of interest in understanding how to stop the onset of these behaviours, but also prevent their reoccurrence once they have happened. However, despite a huge body of research since the 1970s, uh, in terms of um, our success in responding to this type of crime, the evidence is pretty mixed. So there is there is some evidence of some programs in some contexts working fairly well. However, our traditional responses to domestic violence, so these are things like protection orders, arrest, uh, the Duluth model of men's behaviour change, shows that they're only really effective in some, cir some circumstances under particular conditions. So to prevent this harmful form of violence, what we need to do is start looking at related uh, theoretical constructs that may not have typically been used to understand intimate partner violence to see what additional information they could bring to the table. So one of those related theoretical bodies of work is um, desistance research. So Michael has done a pretty good job of uh, providing an overview of what desistance research is, but just to reiterate, it is the examination of the processes through which offenders stop or reduce their involvement in criminal behaviours. So desistance research has primarily been developed off the back of in-depth life narrative interviews with male property offenders. And this is a point worth, I guess, um, emphasising because this immediately raises some questions about the relevance of this theoretical body of work for explaining um, intimate partner violence and other forms of expressive crime. So I'm not going to go into the ongoing criminological debates about acquisitive versus expressive crimes, but there are some unique dynamic dimensions associated with intimate partner violence, which make it different from potentially property offending. So in particular, one of the things that differentiates between these two types of crime is the role of victim survivors. So victim survivors as part of intimate partner violence um, have ongoing interactions with their partners um, both before, during and after crime events. So they're in a pretty good position to actually kind of talk about what their partners are doing and to also implement strategies to mitigate their day-to-day -day risk and also support longer term behavior change. So these are the two kind of, this is kind of the lens that I started my PhD uh, research in terms of trying to understand the applicability of desistance research, which is primarily being developed through the lens of male property offending um, to see whether or not it's applicable to intimate partner violence specifically. So generally, it's a very grounded theory approach in terms of just trying to basically explore these concepts in more detail. So what I did was is I recruited uh, 40 women living in the Australian Capital Territory, which is where I'm based, um, and conducted in-depth life narrative interviews with them to talk about their experiences of desistance of the violence that was being perpetrated against them by their, male, by their male partners, as well as the role that they thought that they played in that process. So of key kind of relevance here is how I define desistance for recruitment purposes. So this was based on the extant uh, desistance research in terms of how measures of desistance have been operationalized. Um, so even though there's ongoing debate about the role of identity change and that kind of thing in desistance, primarily it's about behaviors or the absence of behaviors. So for the purpose of the study, recruitment was based on that women had to report that the violence or abuse had reduced significantly or stopped for six months or longer while they were still partnered. However, I also recruited comparison groups of um, women who said that desistance only occurred once they had separated. So this is for comparison purposes. So the key findings that I really wanted to talk to you today, because it is a massive study, um, is really focusing in on that first question of even just our current definitions of desistance relevant um, for explaining um, intimate partner violence. And based on the conversations and well, the in-depth um, uh, interviews that I conducted with female victim survivors, there were some potential gaps, even from an initial kind of point of view in terms of understanding the role, well, understanding how uh, current definitions of desistance are relevant to intimate partner violence. And two key findings kind of came through. So as described by Michael, when we talk about desistance, it is primarily about the cessation of offending behaviour or the reduction of offending behaviour. And this is observable over time. So we see that even if it hasn't stopped, that it is decreasing in severity or frequency of behaviours. And women talked about implementing a huge range of different strategies over quite long periods of time because they were with their partners for a median aid time for of about six years, trying to both protect themselves on a day-to-day -day basis, but also to support longer-term behaviour change. And this was 
strategies aimed at changing themselves, their partner, but also third party help seeking. And even though many of these strategies were underpinned by mechanisms which desistance research has shown to be positively associated with desistance, the cessation and reduction of domestic violence was quite rare. So I guess from that point of view, I only really defined 15 women in my sample as having experienced desistance. However, when I started to unpack what women were experiencing on the ground, what I did see is that although women said, oh, look, I didn't experience a reduction or cessation in violence, but what I did see is that I had the impact, I had a notable impact on the deceleration of an escalating pattern of behavior. So they were saying, if I hadn't been doing what I was doing, I know that the violence would have been escalating. But when we think about it from a desistance point of view, primarily our measures are focused on cessation and reduction, but we don't really think about it from a disruption point of view. So the question is, well, how does disruption kind of fit within our current definitions of desistance? And this is not only relevant for intimate partner violence, but broader, um, I guess, uh, thinking about how we measure the impact of interventions and things like that in terms of the disruption effect on trajectories of offending that would have otherwise occurred. That's my very terrible attempt at trying to kind of visualize what it actually looks like, but let's just move on. Okay, so the other key point that I kind of wanted to make as part of my presentation was that um, explicitly or implicitly, when we talk about desistance within the research, we talk about it as typically a unitary phenomena. We kind of assume that even though we understand that most offenders are generalists and they're invo involved in a range of different offending behaviors, we talk about desistance as almost like a global thing that happens, that they stop offending in a range of different um, domains. And we don't really unpack the relative, I guess, trajectories of different types of offending within the narratives of offenders. However, this is really important when we think about from an intimate partner violence point of view, because even though women said that they met the criteria for the study in terms of there was a cessation or reduction of domestic violence, when I actually really started to unpack this with them, um, that it was really notable that the different forms of violence and abuse they were experiencing were on different trajectories over different points in time. So what we see is that physical um, abuse was primarily the thing they were thinking about when they were looking at desistance, but there were other forms of behaviour that were either reducing, persisting, escalating, or even starting for the first time in their relationships. So when we think about the definitions of desistance for intimate partner violence, I think we need to be more cognizant that there are different forms of violence which may be on different trajectories at different points in time. And I think this is also relevant for understanding of desistance in other non-IPV contexts, because as I said, many offenders are generalist offenders, and so we're going to be involved in a range of different offending behaviours. So as I kind of said, the findings from the very brief findings I've identified um, at this stage, um, just in relation to definitions, do throw into question the relevance of desistance theory in terms of its applicability to intimate partner violence. Um, but I think also this study has kind of shown some of the issues that we may have with definitions of desistance as it relates to other forms of crime. And on that, I will leave it there. Thank you very much. Wow, you're under time. I think that's the first uh, first time that that's that I've seen that happen. Um, so thank you very much for uh, thank you very much Haley. Um, that was really interesting. And if you've got any questions for Haley, then please put them in the Q and A box. So next up, and I have lost the program again. It's me. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, the program oh no, keeps disappearing okay. from my browser. Uh, I don't know why. So next up, we have uh, Brandy Parker from Penn State. Um, you're clearly ready, so uh, please stop. Hi, everyone. I'm Brandy Parker. I'm ABD at Penn State. And today I'll be sharing with you some very preliminary results on a project I'm working on examining educational attainment as a potential turning point for justice involved youth. Some of this I'm going to go through pretty quickly. Um, so if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to discuss in further detail in the Q&A. So just to provide some background context, scholars um, have recently argued for renewed attention to social context in the study of continuity and change in offending over the life course, and specifically also a need to move beyond turning points typically considered. So beyond turning points like employment and marriage. 
In the global context, one of the most significant social changes over the past century and a half is mass education. So we've seen an explosion of education over time. In the US specifically, the status dropout rate has decreased by more than half since the mid 1970s. And importantly for criminologists and something we need to pay attention to is that educational disparities between the US prison population and the general population have increased over time. And also importantly, failing to meet educational milestones has become more consequential as society has become more educated. And this includes turning points that we've typically considered like employment and marriage. So this may mean that education in the current context has serious implications for offending. So what do we know from prior research? So there's decades of research that says that youth involved in crime and the justice system are less likely to graduate from high school. Um, and earlier and more serious offending and justice system contact appeared to be especially detrimental. But evidence on the crime reducing effect of high school graduation dropout on offending and justice co system contact is decidedly a lot more mixed. Um, importantly, one area that I see as a gap in this literature is that there's almost an exclusive focus on the high school dropout versus graduate dichotomy. And I argue that there's really a strong need to move beyond this dichotomy. There is some research that looks at college matriculation and graduation, but we need to start paying more attention to education credential heterogeneity among high school dropouts, given patterns that we know about high school graduation for offending populations. In particular, I argue that there's a need to look further into the GED. There's some evidence that youth that have experienced justice system contact are more likely to drop out of school and later obtain a GED. And there are much higher rates of GED receipt in US prison populations than in the general public. So this is our population of interest. So my overarching research question here is educational attainment a turning point for justice involved youth and I focus on high school graduation and obtaining the GED. Thank you to Michael for already discussing the pathways to desistance, which I'm also using. Um, I will just add that at the end of the study period, of respondents are in their early to mid 20s, so I can track them until then. So my key dependent variable is frequency of offending. This is across 22 crime types. And the models I will be running are negative binomial hybrid models, which I can talk in more detail about if anyone is interested. Um, and my key independent variables are whether respondents graduated from high school or obtained the GED. And to run these hybrid models, essentially what I'm doing is running a negative binomial random effects model but including with individual effects in these models by time demeaning um, the recall value from the mean across all recalls. So this is more equivalent to what you would get with a fixed effects model. I have a couple time varying controls, including age. So age will control for age trends over time and exposure time, which is the number of weeks and the recall that the respondent was in the community. And then I have an array of time stable controls that are all measured at baseline. So I have individual demographics, family demographics and household, individual differences in impulse control and early behavioral problems, delinquent influences and a few measures of social control. So what does education look like in the pathways to desistance in general? So if you look at the sample as a whole, you see that only 25% of respondents graduated from high school by the end of the study period, while 31% obtained the GED. So the GED is more predominant in this sample than graduating from high school. Then 33% didn't graduate from high school or obtain a GED by the end of the study period. There's 11% of the sample that we don't know what their educational outcome was, but even at its best, only 36% of respondents could have graduated from high school. And my analytic sample is about 10,000 individual recall periods across over 1,000 individuals. For now, I am doing list-wise deletion. And if you look across the waves, you can see that respondents had graduated from high school in 18% of individual recall periods and had obtained a GED in 21% of individual recall periods. So what do these models actually look like? 
So this first set of models just includes the between and within individual effects for high school graduation and obtaining the GED. So if you look here, you see that individuals that graduated from high school offend less frequently and those that obtain the GED offend more frequently. But then when you turn to the individual effects within individual effects, you see that both are negatively associated with frequency of offending. Then whenever you include time variant covariates, so these are the age trends and exposure time, the within individual effect for high school graduation is attenuated. Um, so this means that the high school graduation effect that we're seeing within person over time is explained by just gradual changes over time and offending that are associated with age and also the amount of time in the community um, respondents are in the community. And then finally, whenever you include the time stable covariates they are all measured at baseline, we see that the between individual effects for high school graduation and obtaining the GED are attenuated. Um, and here, they most uh, are mostly attenuated by these individual differences in impulse control, early behavioral problems, delinquent influences, and some measures of social control. So to reiterate, the between individual effects suggest that people that graduate from high school are offending less and people that obtain the GED offend more, but these um, associations are attenuated by background factors. When we look at these individual effects, within individual effects, you see that those that graduate from high school, there does appear to be a decrease in offending after graduating from high school, but this is attenuated by age trends and exposure time, but the GED effect remains within persons, even including age and exposure time. So my next steps are to build out the statistical model more, include some alternative measures of offending and include lead and lag effects to assess the sensitivity to the timing of educational outcomes. So what does this all mean? So this suggests so far that these between individual uh, effects that we're seeing with high school graduation and the GED are driven by selection. So individuals that graduate from high school and obtain the GED have different characteristics that are also associated with offending. But these within individual effects is the non effect of graduating from high school surprising. If we look at past literature, maybe not. Um, prior scholars have talked about graduating from high school or dropping out as the end result of a long process of educational attainment, such that when the event actually occurs, the event itself doesn't matter that much for someone's offending. But the preliminary results here suggest that the GED may be a turning point for justice involved youth. And if you turn towards the education literature, scholars discuss the GED as a chance at redemption. It marks a return back to the school of society after straying from a more traditional educational pathway. So educational outcomes may not matter so much for youth that follow the traditional educational pathway, but once that process is broken and then they re-enter back into more traditional educational pathways, that itself may function as a turning point. So I think there's a continued need to research the effects of educational attainment on offending and more attention needs to be paid to educational credential heterogeneity among dropouts. Thank you. That's great, thank you. Um, I know that and you, another person who is uh, sort of ever so slightly under time. And so for our final um, presenter today, we have Nelly Gesser from uh, Temple. Um, so uh, whenever you're ready, if you could share your screen. Um, that's great. You see that right? Yep, that's fine. Okay. Hello everyone, and thank you for being here on a Friday afternoon. Um, my talk today is gonna to be specific to um, women desisting from street prostitution, and specifically how this is a very nebulous process. Now, if you're wondering about the star alignment in the title, it actually comes from when I volunteered at an emergency shelter for women in street prostitution. 
And staff could never tell when a woman was ready to go into a transitional house and really start the recovery process. It seemed like we needed the exact constellation where every single factor was just in the right place for some internal catalyst to kick in. So I'll start with the end. I'm going to share with you what I found with respect to this moment of readiness and how it is and isn't affected by the offer of support and how trauma can get in the way of being ready to exit prostitution. And I will elaborate on each of these findings later. To give you a little background on women in street prostitution, they are considered one of the most vulnerable populations. Many of them are homeless. They have a very high substance use disorder rates. Uh, conservative estimates talk about 80%. In my own sample, it was 100%. They experience constant sexual abuse, both on the streets, and for many of them, it actually started in their childhood. Um, they also have considerably higher mortality rates compared to the general population. And they also have a high exposure to HIV, tuberculosis, and hepatitis. As a result of all these factors, they also have a high incidence of PTSD and complex PTSD. And due to their high visibility on the streets, they also suffer from repeat arrests that often just create the revolving door syndrome, whereby women are arrested, judged, fined, go back to the streets to pay their fine and get arrested again. What I wanted to know in this study, which is part of my larger dissertation study, is when are women ready to exit street prostitution, despite or maybe because of all these hardships that I've just described? Can we improve their exiting trajectories if we offer them support? And what are the internal barriers to exiting? In order to respond to these research questions, I conducted interviews with 30 women who were formerly engaged in street prostitution. I'm often asked how I found them. And the short answer is in transitional housing programs for women with substance abuse disorder. But I'd be happy to elaborate on this during the Q&A. So here you can see the five agencies from which I recruited my sample, and they're all in the greater Philadelphia area. Other refers to snowball recruitment. The interviews lasted between an hour and 15 minutes to two and a half hours, and they were recorded, transcribed, and the transcripts were coded in Atlas TI. Here you can see some demographics of my sample. Their mean age was 43. They spent an average of 15 years in street prostitution, and their, the mean age of initiation to drug use was 17. 17 of them, or about 60%, started using drugs before they started engaging in prostitution. On average, they had been out of prostitution for three years, but the range was between two and a half months and 19 years. 73% of them reported serious mental health issues, including bipolar, schizophrenia, PTSD, and depression. But I want to emphasize that this was a voluntary self-disclosed information. In other words, I didn't ask them specifically if they had any mental health issues. So it's likely that the true percentage is actually higher. Going back to my findings, just as a reminder, what I found among my sample was three main themes that came up in the interviews. And I'd like to elaborate on each one, give you, giving you specific examples from some participants. All participants are listed by their chosen pseudonym. Despite the fact that readiness was described as a nebulous moment, women seemed to know exactly when they were ready and when they were not. Christine described it as the moment you hit rock bottom. She says, you have to hit rock bottom to know that you don't want that in your life no more. Something just happened, you might say, I'm not doing that anymore. I don't want that but you always return if you didn't hit that bottom where you know for a fact that if you go back, your ass may not survive it. Christine warns that if you haven't reached that rock bottom, you are bound to go back to the streets because you're not motivated enough yet to get out. As I said before, women were also well aware of when they were not ready and were getting into a program for ulterior motives. This is part of a conversation I had with Dahl. Uh, ask her, do people also know when they're not ready to exit? Mm-hmm, she says. 
they know when they're playing or think they're playing the system. They ain't playing nobody but themselves. Did you feel like that about yourself in all those other times that you tried to exit? And she responds, hell yeah. I know I was manipulating and playing the system. Yeah, like I needed somewhere to live. I needed a way to get an income. I needed somewhere to eat, bathe, and wash my butt and wash my clothes. Yeah. So here she lists all the reasons for her to get into a recovery program that had nothing with her wish to really desist from prostitution. Moving on to the second question about the interplay between readiness and support, Jen provides some insight. She says, women need support. They need a support system to really stay out of prostitution, like a strong support system and a strong desire to change. And I ask her, Okay, so let's break this into two things. A strong desire to change, and that just comes from the support? She responds, no, from you. Like, you have to really want to change. And with you really wanting to change, you'll find support because that will make you look for people to support you. And I further ask, what if the support seeks you before you really want to change? And her response is, it doesn't work like that. I've had people try to help me before I was ready to change. I didn't change. In other words, Jem says that on the one hand, people need a strong support system in order to exit prostitution. But on the other hand, the support is not very helpful so long as they're not truly ready to exit prostitution. And I wanna say that one of the sentences that repeated the most in my sample was, I just wasn't ready. Finally, with respect to the last question, Clarissa explains that if you're depressed, it's hard to be motivated. Or in her words, she says, I'm down, so my motivation to exit is really low. And Sarah explains why mental health plays such a heavy role in the process of exiting. She says, you have to be really be ready to get your life together. And all the trauma and the pain, you've really got to be ready to deal with all that. And if you're not ready to do that, then you're not going to. I've had chances to stop what I was doing years ago. I just wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to deal with everything. Having to deal with a lot of trauma that you went through in your life without resorting to drugs and as self-medication can certainly be challenging. So where do all these findings lead us? What I found in the interviews is that while prediction of readiness is challenging, women are well aware of their own readiness. So you can get the women into the program, but perhaps getting the program into the women might be more challenging. My findings lend support for Giordano's hook, hooks for change theory, that women will gravitate toward people and services that can help them once they're ready to receive that help. So in terms of the research questions, although more support does not mean more equal, more exit, sorry, readiness coupled with support does provide for a successful exit. And whereas sometimes we don't understand why women wouldn't want to leave prostitution behind, I think we can understand that it is hard to expect women with mental health problems to want to address past trauma and be motivated to exit. In terms of limitations of the study, there are three characteristics of this sample, so any conclusions may be unique to them. Specifically, this was a cisgender women only, all of whom had a substance use disorder, and they engage specifically in street prostitution and not other types. As far as implications, although it may be very frustrating, we have to accept that like star alignment, we really just have to wait for the women to be ready. However, while we wait for it, it is important to have the resources lined up so that when a woman is struck by that lightning and identifies her own moment of readiness, the resources are there waiting for her. It is also important to advertise these resources so that if women are debating, maybe that knowledge can tip the scale toward exiting. And finally, it is very important to provide mental health treatment and specifically trauma counseling to women engaged in street prostitution, perhaps even before they begin their exiting journey. Thank you, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. And that was great. Thank you very much. Um, so. Uh... As, uh, as, as often happens, uh, we've got one uh, question at the at the moment, uh, although it's very likely that more will come in. Um, so just for, for Nili, um, can you elaborate more on your recruitment 
strategy? I know you talked about, you mentioned yeah. snowball um, sampling, but the initial feed, I suppose. Sure. So the challenge was to find women who are no longer on the street. So obviously I couldn't recruit on the streets, but um, I needed to find them somewhere and uh, also to gain access to them. So um, what ended up happening was that through the coordinator of a local prostitution diversion program that uh, had a population that I wasn't interested in because I didn't want women who were under the purview of the criminal legal system, um, she directed me to other agencies in the community where they send their women. And these all happened to have transitional housing for women who were engaged in um, substance use disorder. And then I um, approached these agencies with the support of the court coordinator. And I say that because I think that was important for gaining access and told them about my study. And then from there, we just continued in various ways. Either they selected the participants for me or they posted my flyer or they invited me in to talk to potential participants and whoever wanted to participate, um, we moved on from there. Thank you. And another question for, for you. Um, were women um, fearful of not being accepted by wider society uh, once they desisted from prostitution? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I didn't hear. Were, were women fearful of not being accepted uh, for, um, in wider society when they um, desisted from prostitution? I assume yes. I'm sorry, but I missed the very beginning of it again. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, were women fearful of not being um, accepted if they if they desisted? If they desisted, or if they didn't? If, if they well, I mean that's an interesting question. But 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 the, the question is if they desisted. But uh, I suppose there's the risk of non-acceptance both ways and by different groups. So I asked them if they sensed any stigma against them. Um, and surprisingly, the majority of them said no. Um, this is not, um, this is a part of my finding that I still need to analyze uh, more closely, but for the most part, they did not sense, they, they had a sense that once they were in recovery, um, they were sort of on equal footing with other people. Um, so it wasn't, there was a, a great deal of shame that they felt, but that was more internal rather than external. Like it was coming from their own um, sense of uh, morals and, and um, standards rather than from other people. Okay, that's, that's interesting. That is, and it is surprising that, um... That they, they, they weren't more yeah okay that's interesting right um so we will have to to draw it to a close there i'm sorry that we're having to be so strict on on time with everybody um but uh, there's another session in on this stream which is the same zoom stream uh in in 10 minutes and, and the speakers on that need time to come in um but thank you very much to all of our speakers thank you very much to everyone for um attending and, and supporting uh, this first year of CrimCon. I certainly hope that it will be something that um, continues uh, in, the, um, in the future, even when we are allowed out of our bedrooms. Um, and uh, yeah, have a great um, evening, afternoon, morning, middle of the night, whatever it is. Thanks very much. Thanks all. Thank, Thank you. you. If you're just joining as a participant for the next session, uh, then I'm uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask I'm going to have to kick you out, uh, and then it'll restart. That uh, the reason for that is that it works with the recording for um, for for, uh, for the sessions. So you'll get kicked out. Then if you rejoin, the new host, which is somebody different for the next session, will come in. Okay. Okay. Bye. Thanks.